So my name is Rick Grehan. I was born in Belfast in very late 1969, and that was the beginning of the modern day troubles in Belfast. So I'm not too sure how much anybody knows about it, but basically people in Northern Ireland were fighting with the, the British about independence of Northern Ireland. So I grew up a little bit like this young boy here, just used to seeing soldiers walking through the streets, going through checkpoints, being searched all the time, having to leave shops because of car bombs and, and uh, even school having to break up because of bomb scares. So a bit of a rough time, but it was just normal for us. Um, my family was very involved in peace activism. My father was head of the civil rights movement and um, my aunt's sister won a Nobel Peace Prize. So we were kind of stuck in the middle of these two, two sides that were warring factors and uh, hated by both actually being peace activists. And um, so even from an early age, I was um, wearing placards. We were chaining ourselves to the railings of uh, city halls and doing good old fashioned activism. So I'm basically started working in advertising. I trained as a graphic designer and um, you know, growing up in Belfast, we were boycotting everything, even in the old days before boycotting was fashionable. Uh, so we were boycotting everything from Starbucks to anti-apartheid movement um, in South Africa. And uh, even in school projects, I was making lino cuts of Nelson Mandela and ANC posters and uh, really just trying to make a difference. But I ended up working in advertising. And um, I just remember being struck. I had to work on these brands that I didn't really agree with and uh, help promote them. And I just thought, that's just normal. It's, it's life. You're tied up in this economic environment and you just have got to work with it. And then in my private time, I was doing activism, making short documentaries in Palestine and Israel and in Africa. And um, only in the last maybe 10, 15 years, um, it became, you know, social business started to rise and CSR started to become popular. And I started to see a convergence of my daytime job and my passion. I was working in South Africa. Uh, I was a bit early on that slide. And, um, you know, I was getting very delusions, almost a little bit depressed with, you know, working in advertising. I was even introducing myself. Hello, I'm Rick. I convince people to buy stuff they don't need, you know. And, uh, you know, selling detergents and all sorts of things. So um, I decided to give it up and uh, sold my business, bought a 4x4 four four and started a trip from Cape to Cairo and uh, raising awareness for AIDS orphans in South Africa. And uh, this is kind of my first introduction to how difficult it is to, do, to work for good, to do good causes. Um, you know, I was going around my old clients and trying to raise sponsorship and was really shocked that you know, if you can't raise money for AIDS orphans, you know, what can you do? These people, these were the, the ultimate victims of uh, circumstances. But yeah, very, very difficult to be, to do good work. So I drove all the way up to, to Cairo. And um, after that, I moved on to India to find myself. And uh, yeah, I was, I was kind of the, the cliche white guy walking through India trying to learn yoga. I, you know, I was very inflexible. Uh, I remember my first yoga class, I went up to Rishikesh, which were the Beatles went in the 60s and took a lot of LSD. Uh, that's finished now. And uh, so anyway, I was going to my first yoga class and uh, asking, okay, got up at four o'clock in the morning in the shower uh, and went into this uh, beautiful temple and everyone was just sitting in lotus position. So I was sitting very uncomfortably. And after about an hour or so of doing nothing, I started to think, God, I'm in the wrong place, in the wrong class. You know, where's the yoga, you know? And I went up to the guru and said, you know, where's the yoga? And he says, what are you talking about? This is yoga, you know? And um, I said, no, what about all the stretching? He said, that's just warming up so that you can sit for a long time as yoga, yeah? So that was my first experience of yoga. And um, yeah, I haven't got much better at it, but still, I can touch my toes on a good day, you know. So I'm um, traveling around India, really trying to discover myself and trying to find out what I'm going to do, find my purpose and, you know, get away from the evil world of advertising and branding. And I just kind of came to the realization that, you know, it's all about intention. It's all about, you know, what you're, what you're selling or what you're talking about. And actually advertising and branding could become an amazing, uh, what would you say, energy for change. Yeah? So yeah, there's me 
looking like a hippie with my uh, CND t-shirt outside of Shikesh. And so one thing I learned through that process was about the monkey mind. Everybody talks about the monkey mind in yoga in India. And it's all about, um, you know, we have this incredible brain that's, it's basically a database of responses to learn patterns you've developed through your life or have been passed down. And uh, you know, we really shouldn't trust it so much. Um, you know, a tamed mind can be an amazing um, uh, benefit to have, but untamed could be like an animal. And, uh, Sorry, what happened there? So, does anybody know what this word is? Problabot? No? So, what's interesting about the human mind is, um, you know, it's always trying to attach things from your past to understand the situation that you're in. So, probably ideas come up in your head, what that word is. You know, is it some sort of robot or something like that? And that's just your mind throwing up ideas, trying to just help you survive, you know? It's a, it's a primeval organ that's basically, and we are all survivors of um, uh, basically run or, or fight responses, you know? So what you have to kind of realize is uh, you just can't trust your mind. You gotta kind of take it as a great asset, listen to it, and then, but look at reality and make your own decisions. And so I started Image Mill in um, Japan, and um, it's been going for seven years now. And uh, basically, we're set up as a company that not only earns profit, but also gives back to society. Uh, so we help brands and businesses find their purpose, and then take that purpose and create campaigns around it, like documentary films or social media or whatever else is, is right for their target market. And uh, we come up with this kind of idea of brand journalism. You know, people don't believe adverts anymore, and with, and, uh, you know, with, and they're very right not to. You know, if you're being sold something, people just don't believe it anymore. So, what I want to do is create companies and brands that are doing good in society, and then we just document it. And just by simply documenting it, it's the best form of advertising. People want to have uh, to work with a good social company. Uh, so why buy media when you can create it? Um, so, um, and there's good reason for that. You know, 66% of consumers are willing to pay extra for products that they know we're giving back. Um, so brands, it's good business for them. They need to wake up. They need to start being more ethical. Um, I'm in Japan, and Japan's really behind. Um, there's only maybe not point not 0.5% of products are um, fair trade, and uh, very little knowledge of it. Um, so every time you spend money, you're casting a vote for the kind of world you want. I'm a great believer in this. Um, you know, it's, some people think it's just one straw, what's the big deal, said seven billion people, you know. All these little small things that we're buying, like the bar of soap, if we really look into behind the companies and make sure that they're doing things socially responsibly, that's the biggest power we have as an individual. Eh? So um, being a creative director, we're always trying to come up with these little catchy steps of marketing, the five steps to this, the ABC of that. So I tried to come up with a little bit of a three steps for a better world. Um, and we've got this triangle. So find yourself is the first one, buy ethically and support a cause. And we come up with this together with my wife, who's in the back of my crying baby. Uh, she's my yoga teacher. Uh, we come up with this concept called All Yoga for people in Tokyo. And it's basically a blend of music, a blend of um, uh, VJ work. There's me VJing. And very, very simple yoga just to get people to start thinking about themselves. And we invited brands to have um, little stands at the back and introduce their ethical brands and also NGOs as well to, to get people to volunteer for them. So very, very simple project. And for them, for the public, it was do yoga, buy ethically, and support a cause. And so finding yourself extremely difficult thing to do. Um, you know, I do Zen in, in Japan, and it really is the most difficult thing in the world. It's just to be silent, to think of nothing. So you don't have to go to that extreme. You don't have to sell everything and go off to India, but just spending time disconnecting. I know how difficult that is for getting off social media. I'm wondering now what's on my Facebook page. Um, so, we got to just spend more time ourselves, even just walking in nature. It's a very, very simple three-step process. Buying ethically, it sounds really obvious, especially to probably people who live around here, but, you know, we keep forgetting and we keep 
just not being aware of what we're buying. So, and it goes beyond that. It's not just what we're buying, it's where our money is. Div divesting is a very, very powerful tool as well. We gotta like take our money out of the banks if we know the banks are funding wars or uh, linking to climate change, for instance, and maybe switch to renewable energy. Number three, support that cause. So everything, the last two ones are more about inter interlooking, but you know, if we can find something that aligns with our purpose and find an NGO, just volunteer for them as well. So uh, as a company, um, one way of doing that, giving back to society, is joining, getting certified, joining Fair Trade. Um, in Meach Mill ourselves, we joined the 1% for the Planet campaign. And this was started by Patagonia Founder. And basically, it's taking 1% of your turnover every year and giving it to one of the environmental charities that are part of it. And this is a really easy way to start engaging and start being a social, social company. And through this, um, it was an amazing change for us. And we met um, the Nature Conservation of Japan, and uh, they became our partner. We were donating 1% to them. But looking at their projects, they had such amazing projects like looking after eagles. But we met this guy, the dugong, and I didn't even know what a dugong was. Does anybody know what a dugong is? Uh, yeah, very more aware than I was. And anyway, so Japan has maybe four or five dugongs left. They're really, really endangered in Japan. And uh, this organization is doing their best to protect them. And so I made this uh, documentary, and uh, we went down to Okinawa four times filming. We bought underwater film gear, trying to look for these dugongs. But they're so elusive that uh, it was just really almost impossible to find them. And, uh, but we learned something very, very shocking at the same time. This beautiful area, they're planning to build an Amer American marine base over the last of their feeding grounds. Um, dugongs are very fussy eaters, they only eat seagrass. And um, this is only in very shallow water, and because of the nature of shallow water, there's always development happening. So there's only really one little last stretch left of this grass in Okinawa, and they're building an American marine base on it. So. So this beautiful area is called Ora Bay, where the uh, dugongs live, and it's got a very, very deep channel. And because of that, there's really amazing diversity of nature there, but also because of that, that's why they, the military chose it as a, a base, so they can bring in their um, aircraft carriers. So. Um, legend of dugong, it's like full of legends. Um, the dugong was basically the legend of the mermaid. So, um, basically, whenever the, the dugongs are mating, they put their heads out of the water and make this kind of crying noise. And uh, they, well, maybe the sailors were very drunk when they saw this and imagined a beautiful woman in the ocean, you know. But in Japan also, like, they would summon, they were almost like messengers of God. Um, they believed they could control tsunamis. And there's all this amazing rich culture and old history about the dugong that we find out soon. Um, so anyway, so this is where they're going to actually fill the, uh, the area to build a marine base. It's, it's very shocking. Uh, and uh, there's activists who've been protesting for 20 years, and they're all very elderly people now, and uh, every single day they go to the base, sit outside and lock arms, and um, they're completely ignored by the media, and uh, so I really wanted to give them a voice through this film. And this is what's happening now. For the first time in 20 years, they started constructing, and they've built this perimeter wall. And um, at the moment, the protesters have managed to stop the landfilling process, and there's a bit of a legal issue happening at the moment. But um, literally, the next couple of months are vital um, to whether they start landfilling. Once they landfill, that's it. It's irreversible damage. Um, so as a company, this has been an amazing experience for us. Um, we nearly went bankrupt because we spent so much time working on the project. We forgot about our normal projects. But uh, we, we got 14 film festivals around the world. It's been m amazing PR for ourselves. But it's such, an it's such a terrible thing that's happening, you know. Um, they're using it actually in the court cases in the USA um, to try to get the military in the USA to, to ban, ban it. So the film's been really, really powerful and just shows you as an individual or as a company, if you can give back or adopt an NGO or a cause, you get so much more in return. So um, thank you very much for listening tonight. And uh, if you have any questions, you can ask me later, I, you know.
Wow, Rick, I got this amazing. On my style, you know? <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, so I'm assuming you've been very passionate in making this documentary. Yeah. I mean, you, 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 like you said, you're working with local NGOs yes. and being an activist yourself to yes. protect wildlife. Right. And you said four, four left. Is that yeah, right? Yeah. So they've been monitoring them with helicopters, etc., and they've got f they've they've identified four. There could be up to ten because they're very very shy. Um, dugongs are very um, friendly in Southeast Asia. You can dive with them in Thailand or you can dive with them in Australia, but in Japan they're they're very scared of of people because they've been hunted. Actually, the numbers have been dropped, and uh, yeah. There's, there's not many of them left. Uh, and may I ask, how was your yeah. documentary accepted to the Japanese community? So, um, I mean, did that make some sort of you know connection, or did it's been very difficult? Um, it's been very successful overseas, but in Japan, criticism against the government is not very well taken. So the film's been been sort of taken with a little bit of um, what was the suspicion. Eh? But uh, we have social screenings every week all around Japan, and it's it's slowly opening people up to what's happening actually. You know? yep. Wow, yep. what's some good stuff there. Thanks so man, uh, yeah. awesome. thanks for that great opening. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. All right, can we have another round of applause for Rick? Thank you guys.